Would you like an opinion on a financial matter you're dealing with? Whether it's about retirement, investments, taxes, or 401ks, Scott Hansen and Pat McLean would like to help you by answering your call. To join Allworth's Money Matters, call now at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome to All Worth's Money Matters, Scott Hansen. Pat McLean, thanks for being with us. Yeah, you're glad you are part of our program today. Both myself and my co-host, we're both financial advisors, certified financial planner, chartered financial consultant. We spend our weekdays helping people like yourself, broadcast on the weekends, being your financial advisors on the air. And uh, yes, it's been off to a phenomenally good year, all in all. Uh, uh, I don't, Yeah. <laughs> like global turmoil. What's going on in the tech between China and the U.S., European Union, and uh, the global tech companies? Um, right. So we're gonna look like possibly ban TikTok, and China's like no more U.S. Uh, you know they've been trying to get rid of the hardware for years, and now they're going after the soft. It's just and the markets just keep marching on. Yep. <laughs> I mean, if you, so I, I uh, was at a dinner, Pat, just a week and a half ago. And there was this guy who spoke. He was with a fun, uh, an organization called Dimensional, Dimensional Fund- Financial Advisors. Dimensional. Fund-, Fund-, Fund advisors? Okay. Anyway. DFA, Dimensional something. Okay. Dimensional. I think maybe they just call themselves Dimensional. Anyway. Um, this guy was uh, probably early 70s. He'd been in the industry 50 years or whatever. And he did a 30 minute presentation. I think you'll find this interesting. A 30 minute presentation on historical media claims about the future, right? So he'd use money magazine. He'd use Forbes. He'd use Barron's. He'd quote the top economists of the day, the top stock pickers of the day. And of course he cherry picked them a bit, but how wrong they all were. And so he went back to 1970 and had you started in 1970 and invested $1,000 in the stock market versus $1,000 in treasuries and where you were at the end of each decade. And it was just, and I've seen all this stuff before. I mean, it's a wall, been, it's, that's why they call it the wall of worry. But usually when things look the bleakest and the all this supposed experts are saying run for the covers, oftentimes those are the best buying opportunities. And when Evan says how wonderful things are and how awesome this is, typically, not always, but oftentimes, those are the times that you should be a little more concerned. Y- y- Cynicism in investing. It was just Works. brilliant. It was just a great reminder. And look, the reality is it would be wonderful to say, well, okay, I'm going to take that a contrarian approach. And when everyone's all excited, I'm going to sit on the sidelines. But th- 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 that you, doesn't work either. Yes, because you can't. Sometimes the trade just outruns the the the, the time period, right? That that where you're like, oh, and you might be right that something bad is coming, but you might be 24 so, months early. <laughs> so right, I'm full disclosure here, right? So uh, I don't think I've bought an option personally in 20 years. Okay. And I've got a degree in finance. I know all this stuff, right? So this was in the 2000s. And in the t- we all, of course, remember the financial crisis. But leading up to the financial crisis, real estate prices just kept going higher and higher and higher. And rents weren't moving anywhere. Inflation was low. And so you're thinking, what is the disconnect here? If why, are, why, are, why is an asset going up in value when the underlying earnings of it Yes. Just take rentals. For, doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. So I bought some puts, which means I can profit when values go down, on Countrywide. And who was the other one? Washington Mutual. I don't think it was two banks. Oh. Because I bought puts okay. on Countrywide as well. I didn't know you bought puts then. I did. And I, I bought lost money on So them. did I. I bought like 24-month puts. This must have probably, this might have been in 2005 or something. Yes. 2004, because at that time it seemed frothy. And like, well, clearly, and, and the reality is we were both right. We were, but lost but money. A bull market can run a lot longer. That's, <laughs> there's, because there's no, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason. It's not the fundamental, it's not 
underlying economics that drive prices on a short-term basis. And short-term can be anything under five years. There, so, so Scott, I, I bought it on con- the puts on Countrywide for two reasons. One, they went bankrupt, by the way. For yes, the, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> and when you buy a put, it expires at a point in time where you actually have the ability to sell it. And a put, and you means you can put the stock on somebody else. You can put that asset on somebody else. And so if you have a put at, say, $40 and the company goes to $2. You buy the share back at $2 and basically you deliver it. put it, it on to, them. That's right. Yeah. So you're betting that, that the price goes down. Well, I thought the same thing about that. But then I met two people that had been newly hired from Countrywide. And I asked them what their training was like. And, they, and I said, did you, did you learn anything about like the weighted average cost of money? Or the average weighted cost of money. And they both stared at me like I was from a different planet. I said, you just went through like two weeks of planning, of training with Countrywide as a mortgage broker. What did you learn? And he said, how to build relationships. And I said, so you really don't understand like interest rates and the finances behind and where the actually loan ends up and how it all works. And they both stared at me and said, no, no, no. It was So in other words, you say, if you're talking to somebody and they have an $80,000 home equity loan at 7% and they have a $250,000 first loan at 5.5%, what is the actual interest rate they're playing on the com- paying on the combined loan? Which is an extremely important number to know <laughs> Which, to determine <laughs> whether it makes sense to refinance. That, that, that would be about <laughs> the only thing you would start with, not like who the person actually... Anyway, but the point being... Um, I didn't know you had done that. I, I did exactly the same, but you the bull markets can run a lot longer than your patients. So this comes well, down to it again. Timing the market is a fool's game. And by the way, this FOMO thing I keep re- hearing about, FOMO, fear, fear of, of missing, missing out. out, comparisons between people's or situation people and or situations is the thief of joy. Worry about in any area of life. One might, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think any psychologist would probably state that sociologist, religious leader, <laughs> like they would all state that. Yes. Comparison is the thief of the joy. Of comparison. Yes. 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 Empathy is, is, is a blessing. <laughs> yes. But, and oftentimes the challenge is, if your buddy, person you work out with at the gym, person in the next cubicle over, person lives down the street, apartment downstairs, whatever, bought NVIDIA two years ago and keeps telling you how great it's doing and you didn't buy NVIDIA, you're thinking... You're thinking you, you've missed, missed out. out. This is the fear of missing out. And quite frankly, you probably did. But... Maybe well, that if you own person, an S and P five hundred, you clearly you own, own a bu- it. You own a bunch of it already. Yeah. And look, just because they did it and got, let's just say, they knew something that no one else could see, or many people couldn't see, or they were just come on lucky. <laughs> it's one thing before the internet age of maybe getting some information before the rest of the world. Today, yeah. it's instantaneous. Yes, and and actually, watch. Go back and look at. Compare NVIDIA stock with uh, Intel stock. I think we talked about that. We did talk about that, didn't we? Anyway. All right. I do want to say something on a personal note, Scott. I uh, went to a memorial um, between now and the last taping of Lou Gusecki. Oh, yes. Who... um, Was that his legal name or was Lou Gallagher? Because he had... His legal name was Lou Gusecki. Okay. So this is for the rest of the listeners. So we, Scott and I have been doing this show for what, 29? 20, almost 29 years. So 29 years. And so we went down to this radio station and said, hey, listen, we'd like to do a radio station. Well, how it started, by the way. So the, <laughs> and we will take some calls, Art, Vince. Uh, we'll, we'll get you in a moment. Um, it, it got started because... Frank, we, you had talked to another f- successful financial advisor who was in Omaha, Nebraska, and he talked about how great his radio program was as both an education tool for kind of the masses, but also as a way to build this brand 
people can see him in action, hear him in action. Get business. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's we are it. business people. Yeah, we are yeah, business. At the people. end of the day, yeah. So I come back from Omaha. Pat and I, starts cold calling radio stations. There it, were more stations back then. Yeah, there were a lot more stations. Yeah. Some of them struggling more than others. Um, now where most of them are just struggling. Um, that is correct. And weirdly enough, they said, Hey, we're really interested. Are you really interested in buying some advertising during the week? (laughs) (laughs) We'd love to have you on on Saturdays. We don't, we don't care if you uh, you play a banjo. If you buy enough advertising, if you buy enough advertising during the week. And I'm like, yeah, we'll try it. So the first Week we get in there, they give us a board operator. His name is Lou Gasecki, but his radio name was Sweet Lou, That's Lou right. Gallagher. That's right. At at his memorial, Scott, they gave he had about ten different names he used over his career. And he was one of those early he was a disc jockey years ago that would you know, do like morning pranks on people and oh, stuff. Yeah, morning zoo. Yeah, he'd <laughs> like he'd call into the local he told me he called into a local prison, he called in sick for someone that didn't actually exist. <laughs> So um, we have it was to, before the day, it was before the days you actually had to disclose that this is a live radio I, program. I right? think so. Anyway, he, uh, he after our first program, he said to both Scott and myself, "You guys really could use some help um, learning how to actually speak on a radio." And so we hired him for a full year. Um, and after every show, he would come back into our office a couple of days later. Or, or meet for lunch. Wealth yeah. advisory office. We'd listen to the tape and try to get better. He gave, and, us, he gave us tips every week. And so um, at the memorial, his his um, his widow asked me his to, to get up and tell that story because I was sharing how important it was. And that, you know, it's in anything in life. You could try new stuff. But oftentimes, if you don't have a good coach... If you do not, especially if it is in a field that you know nothing about, like and radio. we knew nothing about radio, <laughs> except we were listeners. I we, did listen. We knew something. We heard others. Yeah, we How did. How hard hear. can it be? <laughs> it, it, it Sit was, behind a mic. Obviously, it took us over a year to even yeah. get to the basics down. So anyway, uh, just a shout out to. So two points on this. One is a shout out to Lou. Thank you. Thank thank you, yeah. Lou, and for everything he he did to help us and our listeners because. We might have gotten booted after a while. Well, we didn't right. get any better. Uh, but secondly, I think to your point, Pat, is the importance. Look, any great people, all great athletes, great business people, great whatever, they have coaches in their life. If, sometimes formal and sometimes informal. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. And Which, it's and no, different, and the, no different than your finances. It is okay to hire either a formal or an informal coach. But the selection of the coach – is really important. And the value you're going to get from your advisor, you'll see part of it early on. Figuring out some tax savings here, cleaning up a portfolio, reducing some risk. Where you really see it is when life happens. And what I mean by that, either something external, go through a financial crisis, dot-com blow up, whatever, COVID, and someone to help guide you through that. Change in tax laws. Yeah, Major change, or the second thing, something personal in your life happens, a health issue, a death, death. those major issues where suddenly your life completely changes and you need a sounding board and someone to help guide you financially as your life completely changes. That's right. So anyway, um, we're going to hit some shout out to, um, because that's what they would say on the morning show. Shout out to Lou Gusecki. Thank you. Shout out. Yeah. Uh, If you want to be part of our program, love to take your calls. You can uh, schedule us at S I'm sorry. (laughs) Questions at moneymatters.com questions at moneymatters.com or our number eight, three, three 99 worth. Uh, we're starting in California with Art. Art, you're with Allworth's Money Matters. Hi, fellas. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. I have two questions. I, I hope we can get to both of them. Okay. First one might be kind of fast. It's pros and cons of converting to 401ks to a Roth. And the uh, second one is what to do with large capital gains for a rental property. Let's – um. All right. So <laughs> – these are neither one of these questions we could ask answer in a vacuum. So my my twenty six year old son 
who has a, um, is in, just got out of flight school and is a flight instructor, his income will be low. This would, is a phenomenal year for him to, tra- to convert 401k to Roth because he's in a low income. It would make 100% sense for him to do it. A physician who's uh, at the peak of his or her career, maybe not the most things. And same thing with. So is your son going to convert that thirty one hundred dollars from his <laughs> iron to a raw? <laughs> anyway, so Vince, my, I mean, sorry, Art. My point is like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so we're married. We're now both seventy two. We'll be seventy three late this summer. Our annual income pensions is about one hundred and twenty. Social Security is about 85, and rental income is about 85. We don't we don't have any debt. And what and, what problem are you trying to solve? Well, right now we're in the 24 percent bracket, and as I see the tax brackets, the federal tax brackets, uh, it looks like I'm you know maybe. 20K away from joining the 32% bracket. And I think because of the, you know, the huge deficit, I think brackets are going to go up one way or the other. So I'm looking what, for- And how much, do you have, in, how much do you have in your 401Ks, IRAs, non-Roth? I have 150,000 in 401Ks. I have 50,000 in a Roth. And then we just have, uh, you know, 500000 in just uh, ordinary investments. But I was thinking about doing the Roth conversions, you know, in a two-step, yep. you know, maybe uh, 50000 each year. What, what, and how many children do you have? Two, adult. And are they the beneficiaries of your entire estate? Is anything going to charity yeah. or is it all going to them? All going to them. Okay, and, and what's their yeah. are, are they, what's their income look like? Are they almost three hundred thousand, like you are. One is, and the other one is, uh, you know, maybe uh, one and a half, one fifty. Because the odds are you're never going to spend these dollars, right? Right. Because just looking at the rest of your assets, like you'll end up taking re- if let's if let's set this Roth aside. If, if you didn't do the Roth, you'll just do the required minimum distributions, um, and until you end up passing away, uh, and then your kids would end up you and your wife. Are you are you giving uh, to charity right now at all? Very negligible. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, to I do think some. it make. I, I well, I wouldn't just pick a number. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense to do some. If I were in your situation, I would wait. Uh, till near the end of the year, frankly, I'd probably wait till after the election to see, <laughs> get a kind of a little more clarity on what you're not going to get clarity, but maybe have some idea of what could happen when these tax rates expire. And do a pro forma tax return and figure out how much you can do with that marginal rate. There are some programs that make, can calculate this stuff where it takes not just a, my income is 200. It's, it's it, how it affects your Medicare. It, and, yeah, it has every, it will list everything. So you can, these programs can look at everything and calculate exactly the tax ramifications. So you can, you, you can have a good idea of, of, of knowing where you're going to be. And my guess is this 500,000 in, in, in other a variety of other things also spends off taxable income to you. Does it not? Yes. But you might've yeah, included that in the 85,000 that you mentioned as other income. No, correct? no, I didn't include that. No. Oh, well, but, and the reason why I didn't is because, you know, again, it depends upon, you know, obviously, uh, you know, capital gains, but we, we generally, you know, that portfolio of 500,000 is split about, you know, 300 value stocks and I'm sorry, 400 value stocks and, and 100K just aggressive. And, and again, we don't really change our investments very much. So it's not throwing off a lot. It's just. And what's the 401k itself. invested in? Um, target date funds. Why? Well, that's a good question. That that is that is my bad. You, you so, so 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 you, so you would benefit from actually taking a tax strategy on top of your portfolio, right? Okay. Because you've got value stocks there because you you're looking for dividend in there, and I would make the argument that you should probably have those inside the four hundred one k. And I don't. I was saying the same thing. And exactly. The, and then actually, I don't know why you would own target date funds either. Well, that was a, that was a bad call on my part. Well, whatever. I, I, it's I not too late now, though. I would have it. 
It, given your situation, I, I would have 100 percent equity. Yes, 100 percent equity. First of all, you you seem like you're an experienced investor. You, you've lived through markets. You're 72. You've lived through markets up and down. What? Tell me. Well, before we circle back, um, tell us about. You mentioned about capital gains and rentals. What are you trying to accomplish there? Well, you know, I, so I manage my own properties, but I'm not going to be doing that forever. And the kids, you know, uh, the two boys, they're they're about uh, you know an hour away from Sacramento, so they're not going to be you know, probably too enthused about it. And I thought, well, if, you know, if we convert that property, I've got you know just huge gains because I've had those rentals down for you know twenty twenty five years. I would not. But, uh, do you have a property manager on there? No, not okay, yet. Okay, well, that's the first thing I do. That's the first thing I do is a property. That's going to be a lot less expensive than the capital gains. Yeah, that's the first thing I would do, and then and the, the second. And I know you can exchange, but y- you can exchange, but maybe you like them. So, well, I, had, I actually had a question about the about the exchange. Well, too. I don't know much about it. Okay, so let well let, let's hit this one. So, I, I own properties, Scott. That's I, and I wouldn't think of actually owning these things without. In fact, I could. Although tell I had you, a conversation last night saying I don't think I'm going to buy any more property. Like the older I get, the more I appreciate owning stocks. And I and I it I doesn't bother me. But I've got by the way, I've I've gone through a couple of property managers to get to the to the right one. Um you you probably want to consider buying a property manager and if you don't exchange, my guess is you're gonna die with these. So an exchange is finding a like kind property. You can take two rentals. And residential rentals and put them, put them into, into another larger or, rental, or you could do them yeah, into I was commercial. Yeah, leaning more toward commercial. You, you have you own commercial? Well, if I could do a a ten thirty one exchange from residential property to commercial. Have you owned commercial properties? No, no, I have not. Okay, no. so uh, and what's the they value? They have their own issues. Yeah, what are the what are the values of the residential properties combined? The equity, uh, I'd say probably. Mm, well, maybe a little under two million. How many rentals do you have? Four. And what's your basis in them? Oh, geez, let's see. My basis is probably uh, maybe maybe a little under a million. So here's what at, at a two million dollar uh, at a two million dollar property. Where are you located? Well, it's more than that. It's got to. It's Sacramento. It's 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 yeah, yeah, the it's, face value. Yeah, what's the face value of the property? What are they all worth? Not not it, your equity, just face value. Forget about the you, loan you, amount. You you got to you've got to exchange the, the let's say the buildings are worth $3 million. You got to exchange $3 million plus otherwise there's a taxable you'll have a taxable uh, consideration on the boot. Well, so so market value on all four properties? Yes. Um yeah, again, it's probably it's probably hitting at 2 million. Okay, and so okay. you don't have much in terms of loans against these. None. Okay, so uh, it, it may make sense for you to actually do a commercial property. What you're going to have there is concentrated risk, then. And right. rather than someone, you've got someone to evict an individual. Suddenly, you have a tenant who quits paying because their business has gone south. Oh, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I agree. Then you've got TIs. The TIs. So what happens is a, a TI lot. every time the property, depending upon the type of property, if it flips, they want to move this wall, this wall, this wall, this wall, and then you actually have and they to want negotiate. You to pay for it. Yeah, and then you have to figure out the net present value of the rent in order to determine whether you want to do that or not. Um, it's got in your seventy two. I if if you were sitting in my office and you've never owned commercial property again before uh again well yeah. you might not do it before uh I would recommend just stay the course get a property manager introduce what your one or two of your children to the property manager and slowly give that up Well I thought I'd probably if I were to do the commercial property I'd probably just you know just invest in a fund you know, that does that, and I wouldn't it have does. any, any Oh, oh, oh. There's yeah. a, oh, so that, there's the tenant in common. The ticks. And then there's the other, what's the newer? Th- uh, there's other one. But, but Scott, it's back. It's back. I got I invited know. to a dinner um, I know. at Piotti. Looked pretty good. Uh, with the tenant in common. Chicken or steak? <laughs> Salmon. <laughs> it was, um, and I thought, boy, my gosh, it's back. I haven't seen these ticks in a while. The problem with that is lack of control. And lack of visibility into the asset itself. 
And I, I, and I would highly recommend and, against and that. And the fees internally tend up to be about the same as the capital gain tax would be. So I, so I would stay the course. I would okay. stay the course. I would too. I would, and, and hire I, property and, managers. You don't have to think about and it. And I got to. I'm 61. I have four children. There will be a point into. I don't. I don't trade in these properties. The properties I own. I own some with Scott. Um, I will introduce my children into the. To, to manage those properties as I age out. So you don't right now use a property manager? No, no, I absolutely do use a property manager, but, okay. but it takes more than a property manager. The commercial properties are more work than you than you might it, think. Yeah, it takes more okay. than a property manager. And I'm lucky well, enough to be married to an accountant, so a lot of that is done for me as well. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, that you uh, steered me away from the commercial property. Well, I would stay the course. So here... I, you, you, Art, you've done a great job saving, right? You're at a point in your life where more money or less money is not going to make any difference in your life, right? So whether your 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 net income was ten thousand dollars higher or ten thousand dollars lower, not going to have any impact whatsoever. So if you hire a property manager for those four homes you own, it's going to have no impact whatsoever on your lifestyle, zero. So when you're to the negative yeah, I agree. to the, ne- yeah. Sorry? So when you, when you, ju- if you, when you choose to continue to manage it, remember you're doing that not for economic gain, but because you, you're getting something else out of that. And, and um, maybe that, maybe that's fine. Now, if there's a change in step up in basis at death, that's it. Yeah. Different story, different story altogether. What you would expect is that when, either you or your wife passes away, depending upon how the property is titled, that you would liquidate at that point yeah, in time. That's right, because you step up basis. You because of the, the capital Just gains. because of the tax, which is crazy to me, Scott. Yeah, we'll see if that, that I mean, that's one of those things. Well, that was with, you, when Trump was in office, you knew he wasn't going to get rid of that because he's a real estate guy. He loves yes. the exchanges and, um, and we'll see what happens. It, it, uh, it, 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 and look, I'm glad it's there. Uh, many of our clients and myself will benefit from that. But uh, in terms of tax law, it just seems crazy. So unless there's a major change in step up and basis, I would plan on holding to the first death. Yeah. Appreciate the call, Art. Uh, let's head to Missouri. We're talking with Vince. Vince, you're with Allworth's Money Matters. Hey, Scott, Pat, how you guys doing? We're good. How you doing, Vince? Doing great. Um, Wife and I are um, out on the RV driving uh, down to uh, Alabama, and we love your show. We always listen to your show uh, as we're driving, and it's a favorite podcast. Oh, of well, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Your wife, you both like it equally, or one tolerates? Oh, no, she loves okay. it just as much oh, as I do. Oh. And are you going down to the coast there? Yeah, we're going down to Orange Beach. Very nice. All right. right next to Gulf Shores. Very nice. Never been to either place, but I'm sure they're lovely. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, uh, we, we're in a pretty good situation. Uh, my wife uh, retired a couple years ago. She has a, one of those executive deferred comp plans, a uh, non-qualified uh, plan, and she has about $2.6 million in it. And uh, she gets it paid out. It was over 10 to 15-year period. She has about 11 total years still to go on that. So she's getting about 265000 a year on that plan. And I'm still working, but we're we're both going to be 60 this summer. I'm still working, but I'm kind of wanting to retire. And, uh, we're, what kind of work are you doing? Uh, well, I'm an accountant. Okay. And I can, I can work one, I'm working one day in the office and four days from home. And so it's a pretty good setup and, uh, it's, I can probably keep working, but it does kind of get, it does kind of crimp our, uh, our, uh, uh, travel. Uh, it sounds so terrible. We're, we're thinking, yeah, so that's I'm joking. <laughs> I'm looking at you like, what are you talking about? Com- yeah, I'll be retiring completely. And uh, so my question is, so if, when I retire, I won't, I won't have any kind of pension. Well, let me back up. I have a SEP plan, um, so I don't have to take that until I'm 73. So I won't have any. Are you self-employed? Pension. No, I'm not. Okay. I work for a quasi-governmental entity. Okay. And so. Um, when I retire, I won't have any income at all, and uh, she will have that uh, deferred uh, comp plan of two six two hundred sixty five thousand a year. And we were talking about wondering if it's be- if we could maybe file separately, and then I could we have a bunch of money and 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 
uh, the SEP plan IRAs and different kind of uh, pots and thinking if uh, we, we file separately and she claims that money and I don't claim any money and I can convert all of my IRAs into a Roth. And how much and do you have in all these IRAs? Oh gosh, I have a, I have a SEP plan is 1.4 million. I have a 457 B plan is about 900,000. Um, it made it sound like a, f- a first Vince, like you were, uh, had nothing saved and your wife had all the money. Okay, no, so. no, she's, she's definitely the breadwinner of the family, but I held my own a little bit in the marriage. Okay. So 900,000 in the 457, 1.4 million in the SEP. What else? Um, I have uh, an inherited IRA of 140, uh, traditional non-deductible IRA of about 200, um, and then she has a bunch of, uh, you know, she has rollover IRA of 1.3 million. Uh, she has a Roth IRA of 400,000. We did that backdoor Roth about 12 years ago when they first kind of became a thing, and so we've just been putting that into her Roth. So she has a Roth. But I don't have a, any kind of Roth because I had that SEP plan and yeah. it kind of prevented me from investing into that. And when was so the I last time you made a contribution to the SEP plan? Uh, I, I don't actually make the contribution. The company, company makes does. It. Okay. They pay they pay twenty percent of my salary into the into okay. the SEP plan. Um. And um, so, and how so how old are you again? How old you, are you said now? you're sixty? We'll be we'll be sixty this summer. Okay. Well, first of all, just for housekeeping. Just for housekeeping, you should start it with you listed at least three qualified plans that you have everywhere. You, after a, age fifty nine and a half, you can roll them all into a. Well, sink. except for the uh, beneficiary. Except for the beneficiary, yeah. but the rest of them you should be able to roll into a self directed IRA. And just for bookkeeping, you want to do that. But you are an accountant, and maybe you like things more complicated than they need to be, because <laughs> it's easy for you to keep track of them anyway, <laughs> right? But for bookkeeping. I like the CH Yes. Yeah. So I would, I would just, just for booking, and you're going to have the same menu of investments uh, across the board. Whether I would it's be multi- highly suspect that married filing jointly is going to be better for you. Um, I mean, the best way to f- determine it, obviously, is to run the numbers. Um, but like 98% of the time, it, it is better to file married filing jointly. And typically what I've seen is in at least over my career is the times when it's married filing separately, it's, t- it's oftentimes um, those couples that really want to keep their finances separate. Sometimes it's a second marriage and like my finances are none of your business and they, they, they file um, separately, but just the way the tax rates work, it's quite, it, it, it's kind of punishing uh, to people on the married filing separately, but you know, you, you'd have to do the numbers, well, but think- I wouldn't, if it was me, I wouldn't even go through the exercise of doing the numbers. It's okay. how confident I am. It's not yeah, going to be good for you. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it, okay, it so, isn't. So then we want, what's we that? We want to be able to, con- we want to be able to convert any of our money into the Roth because we're in such a high tax bracket. So we're just going to have to lose that option. Do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, You'd have to do it. it. it, I mean, looking at at where your retirement accounts could be 11 years now. So, right. So I think the plan is you're not going to spend any of the other assets. You've got the 265 coming off the deferred comp. My guess is that's what you're planning on living on over the next 11 years. And you've got about $4 million in accounts. Yeah. Then the requirement required minimum distributions are going to be less than 265. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Even at even your income at, is e- probably going to be much lower eleven years out. Yeah, even if these doubled, that's correct. Even if they doubled, which they so, good chance they could. Well, when they so are you saying that I can do the uh, convert into Roth once we turn seventy? Once the first. No, month? I think there's a good chance you'll be in a lower tax bracket. Your your your, your income will be lower. Twelve, thirteen, okay. fourteen, fifteen. Uh, or years equivalent. Now. Or equivalent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's okay. so yeah, three percent of eight hundred million, or three percent of eight million, right around there. Right. To four, yeah, okay. I, 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 yeah, you can okay. uh, well, do well, the pro forma and see. You know, you're an accountant. Uh, just do a joint tax return, and then do, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and then, then just break it apart and do it in sep- do it married fund separately. I'm sure you can do f- probably some freeze. Tax service can do a rudimentary one for you. 
online in probably okay. 30 minutes. Yeah, and then see what it is, but I doubt it's going to do that. And, it, and quite frankly, it's probably never going to make sense for you to convert to a Roth IRA. Okay, that's what I was kind of wondering, but I just wanted to get your guys' opinion on it. I did have yeah, one other I, question. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. With me, with us, with me uh, being this kind of governmental entity uh, that we, I don't pay so, into Social Security, I did, I did for the first 15 years of my career. So I do get a pension. I mean, I'm sorry, I do get Social Security. Uh, will I be subject to that windfall elimination provision? Um, it, because since I have that SEP plan. The uh, SEP won't. The SEP it, won't. Get, only only a tr- traditional not. pension. Yeah, only a defined benefit pension plan would, would uh, trigger the web. Okay, well, that's, well, that's good news. Yes. Great. And yeah. then one last question I have. Uh, if we take Social Security at 62, does uh, does her deferred comp plan, would that reduce the Social Security benefits? Yeah, no. Nothing to do with it. For us. Okay. Nothing to do Wonderful. with it. Wonderful. Nothing to do with it. Well, and by the way, if I were you, I'd probably take it uh, earlier rather than later, just yeah, because based on your net worth. Yeah, that's what we're thinking of doing it at 62 based on years of listening to you guys. Yeah. So yeah so. That's why I wanted to just confirm uh, these answers. So those are good answers I was looking for. So yeah. Vince, really how nice. did you find our program in Missouri? Oh, I, I just was Googling financial podcast years ago, gosh, seven, eight years ago and came upon yours, uh, your podcast. And I just, I think I might've listened to every, every podcast. And we, we have uh, some property down at the Lake of the Ozarks here in Missouri. So we'd have a three hour drive back and forth. And I got my wife listening to it and she became hooked on it. So uh, we, we look forward to listening to your podcast so we feel like we're cheating on each other if one of us listens to it before the two of us are together and in the cars so uh so we try to save them and uh listen listen the whole way down to the down oh, perfect to the perfect well we appreciate that and by the way just i started by saying just for bookkeeping ease of management combine that sep 457 and by the way that deferred compensation and it may not be a big deal but a 457 plan is not your money. It is technically uh, that municipality's money. It is not yeah, the same as my, an IRA. Yeah, I think on my particular one, I, it is mine. It used to be on our company's uh, financials, but uh, quite a few years ago, it got moved off of their financials and balance sheet and, and individually into our own. Understand, understand but if it's a 457, it's still considered an asset of that particular organization, right. regardless of how you're okay. looking at it, a 457. Uh, and by the way, a 401k. So 401k, there's a separate, let's call it like a trust. There's a separate account outside of a company that is designed for the participants, those who contribute and has nothing to do. The company can go bankrupt. So like when Enron went bankrupt, and people oh, sure. were talking about how they lost their life savings. It wasn't they didn't lose they didn't lose anything that was in their four hundred one k. They just happened to have the majority of their money in Enron stock that went to almost nothing, right? Right. But I, I got. It. I thought you were talking about my deferred comp. No, I am talking about life. your deferred comp. Oh, your four fifty seven okay. plan is considered an asset of that. I assume it was a governmental organization of some sort. Yes. Okay. That, yeah, yeah, it is considered an asset of that particular organization. That is, look, okay. I've never seen one blow up. I've heard of one blowing up. Yeah, you've People never had getting, a client. But I've never seen it personally. But why take the risk? I mean, what's the point? There's no reason. So, I'm sorry, what, what are you suggesting that I do? Move it to an IRA, fast. You, you have a black swan event sitting out there that, look, if that... If they file bankruptcy, do whatever. Something very unexpected, right? It's then, not something we can fathom. Yeah, it's the, something outside of the... The creditors could come back and actually claim your 457. Okay, is it something I have to... Do I have to wait until I'm retired? No, you move it to an IRA. You, you, at 59 and a half, you can move it. At 59 and a half, you can move it. Okay, and well, I can move that into my non-deductible traditional IRA? That's correct, yeah. You that's can correct. roll. You combine yeah, a rollover in right. that. Yep, yep. Just yeah. easy. Do that. In one easy. Easy. Thank you for that advice. All right, Vince. Wish you well. And Pat, to follow, continue up on that. So with the 457s, there are some times it makes sense to keep the money there. Absolutely. right? Because if you're under 59 and a half and you separate service, regardless of your age under 59 and a half, you have access to those dollars. In a 457, not a 401k. 
Not a 401k. You're 53, you leave your employer. If you have a 457, you could access whatever you want out of that. If it's a 401k or a 403b for that matter, you're, you, you got to wait till 59 and a half unless you do some, there's a couple, couple ways things. And you're age 55 or older in the year in which you separate service. And, but this show isn't long enough to go through all the minutia. Yeah. Um, and, but, it, it, but if you, if you separate your, your employer at 50, 55 or older, you have access to your 401k, but yes, not an IRA. But not an IRA. So, if you if you if you retire, or leave your employer between the ages of 55 through 59 and a half. It may a, make sense. Yes, there's a good chance it's still going to make sense for you to move it to an IRA. But when you do move it to an IRA, you're going to lose your ability to take withdrawals from that without any restrictions. So, it, it, I should say the only restrictions that your employer's plan may have. So in saying that, you're like, well, what, why are you getting into this? Well, I've had clients that have retired from their careers at 56 or 57. Where the majority of their assets are in their 401k plan. And so let's say there's a $2 million in the 401k. I and might $2 million bucks in the 401k, you got 60 grand in the bank and $120,000 in stocks or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's so not uncommon. I might leave... Two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars behind in the four hundred one k. Move the rest into an IRA and manage it, but still manage the money on the four hundred one k. But we can take distributions with them, pretty much depending upon the plan, willy nilly, once a year, once a month, once every six months. Um, so that's why it matters. Yeah, and uh, another way someone could accomplish that is by doing what's called the seventy two t distribution, where you set up a distribution that's designed to last you to your dying day, which we saw a lot of like in the nineties, early two thousands, when people were trying to retire as early as possible. Again, it's, uh, this is just some of the stupidest garbage. I think that I have what all these different rules about the things that do the same yeah, thing. It keeps us employed. <laughs> it's just, no, I'm joking. It's just dumb. It just really but is. It's never going to change. It's not going to change. Because we know it's all through legislation and we see how legislation, they can't get, they can't get the basics. Congress can't get the basics. Like the budget? Like the budget, like the border. No one likes the border. <laughs> well, they can't seem to get, you know. Most people don't like the border. The issue the issues at the border. Yeah. Most people do like borders. I like okay. borders. <laughs> you know what I mean? My <laughs> only point is to expect Congress to come through like, and say, let's simplify the retirement plans. How in the world they can't get th some of the ones that everyone's screaming that we need help on? That is an excellent point, Scott. <laughs> so, I don't know. Well, as usual, it's been um, great having everyone, and we are about at the time that we are going to be taken. Uh, if you haven't um, subscribed to our weekly newsletter, we have a great newsletter that comes out each week. <laughs> I think it's Friday afternoons. Um, uh, go to uh, allworthfinancial.com, allworthfinancial.com, and sign up for our newsletter. I think you'll find um, there's some valuable information in there. There's articles, new articles every week. And there's also just a bunch of great educational material on our website. Similar to the way we have the program, we're trying to just help people with some of that education. So great being with you. It's been Scott Hansen and Pat McLean of Allworth's Money Matters. This program has been brought to you by Allworth Financial, a registered investment advisory firm. Any ideas presented during this program are not intended to provide specific financial advice. You should consult your own financial advisor, tax consultant, or estate planning attorney to conduct your own due diligence.